Now to kick things off here at GearFest 2020, we have a legendary mastering engineer, Bob Ludwig. Bob is an 11 times Grammy winner, a two times Latin Grammy winner, a Les Paul Award winner, and he's won a whopping 18 tech awards. His credits include everyone from Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix to Tool and Daft Punk. He's worked on literally thousands of instantly recognizable classic and cutting edge albums and film scores. We're so excited to have him here. Bob, welcome to GearFest 2020, great to see you. Thank you, Mitch. It's, Thank you uh, so much. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you kick things off for us. I mean, if there's anybody who has a history in the music industry, it's you. Uh, <clears throat> the, um, you got the Grammy count wrong. I just got my 12th this year. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a classical one for the uh, Terry Riley uh, Sun Rings. Oh, nice. Congratulations. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. I think I'm the first mastering engineer to have won one of every category that we're eligible for. Is that right? Wow. Yep. That's for most of my career, we weren't eligible for physical Grammys, you know, so. Right. So they're going to have uh, to change the rules just for you. There you go, right? <laughs> 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 well, it's really an honor to uh, meet you virtually here. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is fun. We're having, we're having a good time. We're just getting things rolling. And, um, man, I, I, I just have to ask you, I, I read somewhere that you actually got into audio at eight years old when you got your first tape recorder. Yes. How did uh, that, how did that everybody happen? Everybody has a recorder when they're, like, out of the womb these days. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, back then, uh, having a recorder when you're an eight-year-old kid was something. My dad was somehow very supportive of that, and... Um, when I got to uh, high school, he got me a, a consumer Ampex machine, so it was very good. I've always had a, <clears throat> a hankering for pushing record on tape machines. So, <laughs> right, right, you got an early start, right? Now I understand that you're also a classical musician. You went to Eastman School of Music. You have bachelor's and master's on trumpet, correct? Yes, exactly. And so, my uh, uh, my bachelor's was on uh, music education, and the uh, uh, masters was on performance as well. So it was trumpet and music literature. So, so I know a lot of classical music literature. So. Right. <laughs> was your intention to pursue a performance career or were you always looking more toward the audio and recording side of things? Well, actually, <clears throat> it's always been both for me. I don't, <clears throat> I don't know why my throat is <clears throat> getting so raspy just as we're starting this, of course. Um, when I was in high school, I couldn't decide if I wanted to go into recording or um, music. And my high school music uh, teacher thankfully talked me into going to Eastman because it was really the best experience of my life. And it was just the most amazing thing to be there. And a great deal of it was interacting with the other students there, which has been making me think of this coronavirus situation where people can't interact with their fellow students as much. So it's... Um, it's a little different it's, these days. It's a new reality, yeah, definitely. At, at any rate, um, so he taught me into going into Eastman, and then um, as a trumpet player, one of the things you learn, of course, is the Brandenburg Trumpet Concerto, and and um, one of my real lifetime goals was to do the Bach B minor Mass using the piccolo trumpet in the very high parts. And um, when I finished East, uh, high school and went to Eastman, then as I was in working on my mas uh, match, yeah, master's degree, uh, I was in the Utica Symphony Orchestra uh, playing for principal trumpet there. And uh, one day they said, oh, we're gonna do the Bach B minor mass. And I went, really? I wasn't planning on doing this for another 10 years. <laughs> so I went to my uh, trumpet teacher, Dan Patrilak, and told him about it. And Eastman loaned me a piccolo trumpet, which was great. And so I really practiced hard on it. And then we performed it twice and it was even on the radio and people liked it. And wow. when it was over, I was like, hmm, not sure that I wasn't expecting to do this so fast. Oh, right. <laughs> and then also while at Eastman in my master's degree uh, years, uh, there was a jazz workshop that they had in the summer sessions. And uh, it was, there was also this arrangers workshop. So all the arrangers wanted to have good quality recordings of them and the orchestra and the jazz bands and all that. So, uh, Eastman hired Phil Ramone to come up from New York and teach um, a recording workshop and also <clears throat> to specify what the school should have for this uh, uh, jazz workshop. And so at the end of that workshop, um, uh, you know, Phil asked me if I wanted to come work for him in New York. And I was like, wow, you know, this was really, uh, it was very exciting. And of course, being in that <laughs> workshop was super exciting. And 
I think I shifted kind of from trumpet into the recording during that workshop. And anyway, I decided that's what I was going to do. At least uh, I could always go back to the trumpet, but uh, here is a lifetime opportunity because as a lot of your student people know, it's not easy to get into this industry and to, uh, to have that happen was just, I was just so lucky. So I uh, came down to New York and worked with Phil as an assistant and uh, one of the things that you do <clears throat> as an assistant at A&R Recording is to learn how to do disc mastering or disc cutting at least. Uh, and the reason for that is back then, it's not so true since about 1974 and certainly 1980, um, but back then disc cutting really did have its limitations. Um, a lot of discs were cut on fixed pitch lathes so that every groove was equally spaced from one to another. And so definitely if there was too much of a bass frequency, it was very easily to have it cross over into the other grooves. Thus the, uh, the whole thing about always having your bass in the center channel, which is still a good idea. Um, and, um, and then, you know, making discs needlessly compressed so the bass didn't do that. Um, so, but when I was doing that, I was taught by Jay Messina, who's still a very active, brilliant engineer. He works a lot with Supertramp. Um, Jay taught me how to cut discs, and then um, <clears throat> A&R was the first independent studio to buy a um, Neumann uh, computer lathe, uh, the VM VMS 66, and that was at the, the other, uh, A&R had two locations at the 112 West 48th Street and 799 7th Avenue, which used to be uh, the Columbia Studios where Dylan recorded a lot, and, uh, and it was a great, great space, and so the stereo system was over there. So I moved over to there and um, back then there was no there was no manual for it, how to do it. So uh, Phil locked myself and a maintenance man, Aaron Barron into the room and <laughs> said, don't come out till you can cut a good disc. And so <laughs> we closed the door and figured out the lathe and uh, uh, it, it was great. But it, it turned out that I kind of, A, had a, a genetic disposition to liking this cutting and mastering and because you have to be very patient you know you have to be able to cut a symphony of 30 minutes long on a disc and on the 29th minute lose the chip suction and have to do it all over again and <laughs> not sail the lacquer into the wall you know right, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be good um so and I, I so i really learned how to do that and, and the other point was is that being a musician from eastman uh, companies like Nonesuch Records, who were a total classical label back then, and uh, Connoisseur Society, people like that, that would never have used A&R, started using them because uh, I knew how to read scores. And uh, so it, it was it was really great. And then once I, I, I did so many great, great, great projects, almost like right away. So it's, uh, right. uh, uh, you know, I got to spend a day with Jimi Hendrix, when he was working on Electric Ladyland, he came over and we just spent a whole day cutting different references for him. And uh, back then, the uh, there were unionized cutters like at Capitol and uh, Columbia and uh, RCA. Uh, so, and this was, uh, well, that was Warner Brothers, I guess, a reprise. But at any rate, it was... Uh, most times uh, I, I wouldn't be cutting the masters on a lot of stuff. So anyway, I got to meet and work with Jimi Hendrix for a whole day. And the thing that was amazing to me is that at the end of our session, when we had to walk back to the other studios for him to pay the office for the, his uh, very inexpensive bill. Um, at the end of it, he was truly concerned that I liked his music. I was like, you know, I'm just this little kid. You know, what do you mean you, you're concerned? You know, but he was <laughs> nice. You know, he was genuinely like touched that I liked it. You know, so that's awesome. That, that's yeah, awesome. It, was, it was really great. So. Yeah. So, so I have to ask you. Uh, uh, there's probably nobody better to ask. The <laughs> the term mastering. There's a lot of different interpretations of what that means, and I think a lot of people sometimes think it's just well, I'll throw a compressor and an EQ on the two bus, and my recording is mastered. So. What is mastering and what is it that you do for a project? Well, I have to say I was mastering um, at A&R for a couple of years. And, and then I think even at Sterling for a while, 
before my parents even could really, really grasp what it was. Um, <laughs> and, and of course, like now, you, you go online and, and you see mastering everywhere. It's just, you know, it's the world is inundated with the word mastering. But back then, it was like this black art that no one knew what it, what it was. So, uh, um, you know, for me, mastering is two things. Uh, it's the the last creative step in the making of the sound of the the record or the CD or the download. And, um, and so we're the ones that in conjunction with the artists and the approvals of the a &R people and who knows who, what, and management, uh, we're the ones that really determine the way the final record gets to sound. And, and again, like a lot of times people will go to me because they just want to hear what my take is on it. Um, sometimes, uh, oh, let me just finish the definition. So this last creative step in the, in the record making process. And then once everything's approved, we put on our different hat and we become the first step of the, of the manufacturing process. And we, um, you know, have to do everything very scientifically and very carefully and painstakingly with lots of checks and people rereading ISRC codes and making sure everything's exactly right. And, um, and then we send the part off to the record label or to the CD plant or the vinyl disc cutting guy. Um, I used to have a vinyl lathe here at uh, Gateway, although it wasn't hooked up when I started it. So we were like the first major studio to have started without disc cutting mm. uh, in 1993. We started, we built this in 1992, but we opened our doors in 1993. And, uh, and it wasn't a while, for quite a while before uh, we decided we were going to do it, and we did it, and uh, and then you know vinyl started getting really slow in the uh, uh, kind of late '90s, I guess it was. And after a while, uh, I did this one project for a big group, and uh, Michael Fremer, who's a uh, great analog audio critic for uh, Stereophile magazine, he called me up and said, "Hey, Bob." <clears throat> I see you uh, uh, master this record. He says, but it doesn't sound like you. It says like all the top is rolled off or something. And I went, oh my gosh, you know, because in, 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 in the lacquer cutting, you know, you never, you're not able to play back the lacquer you cut because it actually, that one playback actually damages it slightly in doing mm -hmm. it. So, um, so the only time you can, the first time you can check it is when it's in the mother stage, metal mother stage. And that's usually at the plant. At any rate, um, I got a, a, a pressing from the uh, the client, and I listened to it. And, and Eddie, um, um, Michael Fremer was right; the top end was really quite rolled off, and so it could be from the cutting. Something could have gone wrong, or uh, in the plant when they're like polishing the stampers and uh, things like that. I've, I've, there's been times where they've actually kind of removed highs from the thing, and so it's th the point is is that I. I asked the um, the record company. I said, I said, uh, um, you know, did you approve this test pressing? And they said, oh yeah. And I, and, the, and the guy said, but he says, well, we don't have any equipment here in our A and R office. Uh, so someone in our London office listened to it and signed off on it. And I says, well, what were you comparing it to? He says, well, nothing. And they just put it on the turntable and it seemed okay. And they signed off. <laughs> so <laughs> I was so discouraged because that is not the the workflow of this cutting and, and master lacquer cutting. Um, and so that day, when I heard that, that day I decided I was gonna sell my lathe and I sold it to uh, Dave Smith at Sony Music. And I think that lathe is since, uh, since Sony Music closed, is I think that lathe is at Sterling now actually in, in Memphis, I think it is, so. Right, right. Or um, uh, Nashville, sorry. Yeah, sure, uh, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So I, I um... Obviously, having seen the thousands of projects that you've seen, I want to ask a question that kind of has, it's kind of both sides of the same coin. And one is, what are the common mistakes you see for projects coming in to be mastered? And the flip side of that is, what can someone do to ensure that when you receive the project for mastering, it's ready to go? Well, the most common mistake for, uh, we, we gauging this towards Professionals or? Well, we have a broad range of viewers. So everyone from, from hobbyists to, to pros, yes. Yeah, okay. Well, for the hobbyists, the, uh, almost without question, the, uh, the biggest problem is not treating the voice properly enough. 
um, like uh, when you're doing a song where the, the lyric needs to be heard, which is almost 90% of the songs, um, you really have to ride that vocal very hard and make sure that every little thing is right. Like, uh, you know, when you open up your Pro Tools, your digital audio workstation thing, the, you know, the, the, the um, automation for the vocal ought to look like that, you know, it should, <laughs> it should have like every word and every phrase should be thought of and make sure that it's all proper. And, and then of course, uh, the professionals who uh, do this for a living, their vocal is all normally perfect, um, but they also send me a, also a vocal up or a vocal down mix, like usually a half dB. Hmm. Uh, so if something is not quite right, we've got it right there to, you know, to compare and uh, see what, what's going on there. So I think that's the, the main problem. It's, um, th that's a number one problem. And then um, controlling dynamics, I guess would be the second one, like, cause it depends on what kind of genre you're recording. Um, so sometimes uh, when people hear a loud record, like, um, uh, like the Alabama Shakes record I did. Uh, um, it's a really loud, loud record. But this record was designed by Chad Everett, the producer engineer from the beginning to be loud. And he mixes in a very loud way. Um, and it's very different kinds of techniques uh, from normal mixing, I would say. There's, it's definitely a lot of crazy things going on to make it all work that loud. And... Um, and so that was fun to get a best engineered Grammy for a really, really loud record, you know, <laughs> because um, the, 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 the thing to know, all the people watching this, is that loudness doesn't buy you anything except misery. <laughs> One thing it, it might get you is if you're, uh, um, you know, have a, a CD player and you're comparing it to other people's CDs, um, one that's louder will jump out at you and demand your attention. And I suppose if you're the uh, pr program directory for a, a, a radio station, having a disc jump out at them and get their attention is a good thing. But for everything else, it's not because all the streaming services that we use now, and of course, streaming is the biggest part of uh, music right now, music uh, uh, reproduction. Uh, most of those services are all loudness normalized, so they have a target uh, level, like Spotify chooses a target level of minus 14. And if you go put your record to a loudness meter and it's um, above that, like way above it, like, uh, you know, death magnetic, which is like um, at minus six, say, um, they're going to see that. And when they go to broadcast it on the stream, they'll lower it 10 dB so that it will compare with everything else. So if somebody's jogging or putting it on in the background, you have to, don't have to keep fooling with the volume control. So because streaming is such a big deal, um, when you get a record that's really crushed um, and loud, again, it might sound really great compared to other things on a CD player, but once it's knocked down 10 dB, you're gonna have a quiet, really nice, you know, crush sounding a little bitty record instead of enjoying the, those uh, 14 dB of dynamics that you really have on Spotify. Right. So, yeah, so it's, it is quite something. So, and right. some uh, services like Apple, um, they have a thing called sound check. Like if you want to hear what the service is going to do, open up your iTunes software and go to preferences and then playback and you'll see a thing called sound check. And if that's not already on, you can put that on and feed it a bunch of like your flat mix versus the mastered mix. And here, once they've been loud and it's normalized, uh, just how impressive the mastering is or isn't that kind of thing, you know? Right, right, you know? right. So, Fascinating stuff. Well, we've got about a minute left in our time here. It's just flown by. I mean, it's, it's been, been wonderful having you here. I have to ask, do you, uh, really quickly, do you prefer to receive a mix where there's been compression and EQ on the master bus, or do you prefer to receive a pretty raw mix? I prefer to have the mix, two things. I prefer to have the mix be as close as you can possibly get it to how you want it to sound. Like you've mixed it, you've checked on different headphones, um, 
different monitoring systems in your car, different people's cars, where you've played it a whole lot and you think, yep, this is really the right mix. And they'll send it to me and normally that's fine. If for some reason you're one of the really loud mixers like Manny or Tom Elmhurst or, uh, uh, or Chad Everett, um, where it's really purposely loud, it's really helpful to have one that's got some headroom because you need some more room to work with it. And uh, so it's good to have both. Right, right. The thing that's really bad is to send me the quiet, uncompressed mix and have everybody in the group be listening to the, the loud one. And so they send me the soft one and I don't know that there's a loud one out in the universe. And I right. do something that's saying, oh, it's kind of disappointing. It's not as loud as our reference. I go, what? You've been listening to something and not sending the master, mastering engineer what you've been listening to? Right, right, right. So, All part of the insane, process, right? right? A lot of insane people out there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, thanks so much for spending time with us today, and thanks for helping us kick off GearFest 2020. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. You're so welcome. It's, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. I, I hope that sometime we can sit down and do a extended two- or three-hour interview where we can really dig into all your experience and wisdom on mastering. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought this was an hour long. That was... It flies by, uh, yeah. <laughs> they got me on a schedule, man. I got. <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining right. us. I've really... done 1,500 videos, something like that. There, yeah, there's more than 1,500 videos in the manufacturer tent area, the manufacturer expo area. It's, it's an incredible weekend. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. I saw you had Scott Hall work on your record, you know. He did, yeah. He mastered, uh, he mastered my EP that came out a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah, Scott, uh, uh, you know, used to work with me at MasterDisc. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, he did a great job. I, uh, Scott's an old friend, so that was that was a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah, he was really great. So right. I haven't seen his new place by the uh, by the atomic energy uh, plant there yet. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, great. Right. Bob, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. And, Thank uh, you. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Thanks very All much. Right. Thank you so much, Mitch. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay.